Good morning this morning, church. Good morning. You awake today? Yeah, a little bit. Good morning. Hey, there it is. We're awake. My name is Zach. I'm the youth pastor of our uh, Anthem Central Youth Ministry here. Uh, and I'm going to jump right in today because we have a lot of stuff to cover uh, in, in a short period of time. And uh, over the last two months, we've been looking at the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. And we're going to continue to look at that book this morning. We're going to see how the early church put the kingdom above all. The same is true for us today in the midst of an ever-changing landscape of people and, and culture and things that are happening. We're learning to keep the kingdom above all. Pastor Chantal led us last week. She showed us this guy named Paul who called himself the worst. He was someone who killed Christians and persecuted people who were following Jesus. And then he became the very person he was persecuting because he had an experience with the risen Jesus Christ. This person who killed Christians went on to raise up godly leaders, plant new churches, and write most of our New Testament. And I think this is an encouragement this morning to all of us uh, that God continues to use broken individuals. And if you're in here today and you're distracted or broken or messed up, have a weight of shame or just not perfect in any way, you're a perfect candidate to be used by God today. That's the message. <laughs> So I'm excited for this. It's going to be a great day as we dive into this next part of Acts. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we just pause and say it's all about you today. Everything we do, the lights, the videos, everything, it's all about you. I pray that everything draws us back to you this morning. In your name, amen. Amen. We're going to get started today in Acts chapter 9, verse 32, and we heard about this amazing conversion last week, again, of Saul to this person, Paul. And the story shifts from Paul to another guy named Peter. And the last time that we saw Peter, he was in Acts chapter 8, and he was sharing the gospel with a group of people called the Samaritans. And the story shifts because something is incredible. Something incredible is about to take place in the early church. And if we remember Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells his apostles that they will receive power to be witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Pentecost, which happened in Acts chapter 2, took place in Jerusalem, which is in the region of Judea. Now, Philip, Peter, and John, they got to go to Samaria and see the Holy Spirit poured out. And it's significant because God is moving forward in his plan. Here's what we can see. The Samaritans, they were not liked by the pure-blood Jews. It's because, long story short, the Samaritans were viewed as half-breeds. The Jews, uh, there were Jews that had mixed with a group of people called the Assyrians, who the Jews had fought with at a time in their history. And so now they were this half-breed, and the pure-blood Jews didn't get along with the Samaritans. So when we step back and see the real big picture of Acts for a second... We see the Holy Spirit is poured out in Judea in Acts chapter 2. We see the Holy Spirit poured out in Acts chapter 8 over Samaria. And all that's left is to see the witnesses that go out into the ends of the earth. And we're going to see a couple of things this morning that set the stage for that to happen. The first thing that takes place is the healing of a person. His name is Aeneas. Say that with me this morning. Say Aeneas. Aeneas, like your knee. To summarize the story real quick, the story goes that Peter was meeting with the believers who lived in a place called Lydda. And this is a place that's a little over 20 miles northwest of Jerusalem. And while Peter is there, he finds this man, Aeneas, laying on a mat, and he finds out he's been paralyzed for eight years. Peter speaks over him and says, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise up and make your bed. And in that moment, he stands and he's able to walk for the first time in eight years. And this is a powerful move of the Holy Spirit through Peter. But what I really want us to see today is how the, how the story ends. And this is what it says in chapter 9, verse 35. 
all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. This is an important thing for us to see right here, that the result of miracles bring people to Jesus. Powerful moves of the Spirit draw us back to God. And this is a theme that we see over and over through the book of Acts. Miracles, signs, wonders is followed by people turning back to God and giving Him the praise. We see the same thing happen in the following story. After Peter is in this place called Lydda, he heads over to the coast. There's a place called Joppa. Today it's known as Jaffa. And uh, it's just a few miles south of Tel Aviv. And this is what it says, uh, starting in verse 36. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which is translated as Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died And when they had washed her, they laid her in the upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent to him, urging him, please come with us without delay. So Peter rose up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. He stayed in Joppa for many days with one called Simon, a tanner. So again, we see Peter, he's a conduit of the Holy Spirit first by healing a paralyzed man in this region between Judea and Samaria. Then he travels even further from Judea and is used to help bring a woman who is dead and she was a disciple of the church and he brings her back to life. Man, I think it's evident that Peter has the gift of healing And with each story, it's significant for us to realize there's an escalating that takes place. There's a man who's healed. He's paralyzed for eight years. That's amazing. And that's powerful. But then Peter kind of takes it up a notch and he raises a woman back to life through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's one more healing that's going to take place in our final story. Um, But it's one that's not physical. It's the healing of a mindset and a perception of people. And it's going to stretch Peter. And here's why. Because at this point in history, you could only receive salvation if you were a Jew. The only way you could be saved was by being a Jew. Whether that was by Jewish descent and you were born a Jew, or by becoming a proselyte, which meant you had to eat the same things, you had to pray, you had to give to the poor, you had to be circumcised. If you want to know what that is, email Pastor Jacob. He would love to answer that. (laughs) He had to follow the Jewish customs if you wanted to become a proselyte. Dietary restrictions, worshiping only Yahweh, all these things. And this is how it was for the last thousands of years. You could only receive salvation if you were a Jew one way or another. That was it. For thousands of years, this was their thought process. This is all that they knew. You could imagine that this created a tension between the Jewish people and everyone else. There was an ethnic divide between the Hebrew people and everybody else because they were the ones that saw themselves as clean. They were the ones that were God's chosen people and everybody else they were interacting with was deemed unclean. This raises a good question for us today in the midst of our own prejudices to ask who are the people that you think are unclean? Who are the people that are in your life that you've deemed unworthy, unlawful to spend time with? And I think we know the right answer and we're going to see that in this story. We know the right answer, but if we were to really look at what our actions say, who, who do we think, who do we treat as unworthy? unclean. Before we start reading our next story, uh, I want to give you a quick tip about reading your Bible. When you're reading your Bible, there's things that are emphasized 
And you can tell they're being emphasized because they're repeated over and over and over again. Or they get a larger section of text talking about them. That's how you know things are important. And the healing of Aeneas that we talked about had four verses in the Bible. Dorcas being raised back to life had eight verses in the Bible. And this next story is the longest narrative found in the book of Acts. And it gets 48 chapters. 48 verses. 48 chapters is a whole book. That, that would be a lot. 48 verses. I was thinking in my head, don't say chapters, and I said it. <laughs> 48 verses, man. This is, this is going to be important. And here's what it says. Our story begins with a guy named Cornelius. He's a Roman centurion, and he leads a group. He's a commander of about 100 people. He's part of an Italian cohort, so six leaders, each leading at least 100 men. And this guy was Roman. He was a Gentile, right? He was a leader, and he was praying, and he has a vision. And this angel in the vision tells him that he needs to send for a guy named Peter over in Joppa, who's living with a man named Simon. So Cornelius does just that. When you have a vision, you follow through. And Peter does the same thing. He sends two of his best soldiers to have Peter come to his home. While soldiers are on their way, Peter, at the same time, has a vision. He's up on the rooftop. It says about the sixth hour, which for us is noon today. And uh, he's waiting for lunch to be made. We all know what that feeling is like. Many of you are probably thinking the same thing. I wonder what lunch is going to be today. But you know how when you're sitting there and you're hungry and you're just like you smell the food, like Peter was probably smelling fresh baked bread and vegetables and spices and, and meat being cooked and prepared and the smell filling the air. You could kind of tell that Peter was feeling hungry. And in the midst of this, he has a vision. And I think it's funny that God uses food to get the point across that was much of much more important to Peter. Here's what it says in verse 11 of chapter 10. He saw the heavens opened up and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, and this is the message for us. It's a simple one, but I think it's deeply profound for us. It says, what God has made clean, do not call common or unclean. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up to heaven at once. And we read after this that Peter's confused, right? And I imagine he would be. He was just sitting on his rooftop. He's waiting for food to be made. He's enjoying where he's at. And all of a sudden he has this vision of God telling him to eat the things that he's not supposed to eat. And so we ask, what's going on here? Was God changing the dietary restrictions for Peter? Or was Peter just so hungry that his mind was playing tricks on him, right? Well, Peter does finally realize what the vision means. The soldiers that Cornelius sent find Peter and they ask him to come to Caesarea where Cornelius lives. And Peter must have figured it out. It must have become apparent to him some way along the way that his vision really wasn't about food, but it's about people. Here's what he says when he arrives at Cornelius' house. He says, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. They weren't even supposed to be together, right? Peter wasn't even supposed to be in this house with Cornelius according to the law. The Gentiles were unclean to the Jews. They weren't supposed to mix this is 49er fans and Seahawk fans. You know what I'm saying? You guys with me this morning? These, they were not supposed to be together. They didn't mix well. There were prejudices in place that made it look like certain people weren't good enough. And to the Jews, the Gentiles were unclean. And I think, again, I just want to ask this question, who isn't good enough for the gospel? Think about it. Who isn't good enough for the gospel? 
For Peter, it became apparent why he was there. He was supposed to preach the gospel. The Gentiles haven't received the gospel in thousands of years, and now this is it. This is the moment. This is the promise of God that has roots all the way back in Genesis and Abraham, and God blessing him and saying, through you, all the nations will be blessed. This is coming to fulfill that moment. It's affirming the words of Jesus and that the good news must be shared in all nations. And Jesus' own teachings says, God does not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world, not Jews, but Gentiles, might be saved through him. The world. So Peter preaches and listen to this gospel message that he presents to Cornelius and his family. It says, Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, everyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. And we are all witnesses that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Amen, right? It says that while Peter was still saying these things, while his mouth is still open and the words are coming out, that the Holy Spirit falls on all who heard it. And this is so important. All the people who had come with Peter were amazed because it says that even the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit. We talked about the healing earlier that had taken place to set the stage for this to happen. And the healing that's taking place now is the realization to the Jews that the Gentiles had come to a saving, genuine relationship with Jesus and had received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was poured out and now there was no denying it. Peter couldn't go back to Jerusalem now and talk to the other leaders of the church and say, yeah, so I preached to the Gentiles and it was good and they're blessed, but you know what? They didn't speak in tongues and receive the Holy Spirit like we did. He couldn't do that because the Holy Spirit was poured out. They did speak in tongues and they bless God. God is making it abundantly clear that the gospel is for all people, not just the Jews. The same is true for us today. God welcomes the people and nations of the world in the midst of, this is crucial, in the midst of, not despite of, their ethnic particularities. God was not creating a group of people that was devoid of cultural distinction, but one that was actually teeming with differences. This is the church This is the body of believers, and this is what it meant to be witnesses to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is my main point today. I only have one. This is my main point. One point for you to walk out with today. If you remember anything, remember this point. I'm going to clap so you remember. This is my main point. The gospel is for you. The gospel is for you. Whether you are someone that has been following Jesus your whole life, you've read through the whole Bible multiple times, you, maybe you've done our rooted class, you've been baptized, you serve multiple times a week, the gospel is for you. For those of you in here that don't know where you stand with Jesus, 
you look around and you see all these people and you might think, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure where I stand in this whole thing. The gospel's for you. For the people that are in here that feel like you've just done too much wrong. You're saying, I'm still too broken. I'm still stuck in addiction. I still have so many mistakes. I can't figure this thing out. It feels like the world is falling apart. And the gospel's for you. It's for me. I was that person. The thing is that this means that the gospel is also for the people who don't look like you. They don't speak the same language as you, don't vote the same way as you, have different sexual preferences than you, and maybe if we're honest, feel like they'll never change. The gospel is for them too. Just like the Jews thought about the Gentiles. But now we get to stand here today in the goodness and the faithfulness of God that we can receive salvation. We can receive salvation. We can be forgiven of sins and placed back into a right standing with Jesus because of what took place here. Man, we can be brought back into the loving arms of a father because Jesus went to the cross for us. This is the kingdom. This is the kingdom above all. A few weeks ago, I, I got to preach and I shared about my sister. And if you weren't here, you could go back and listen to the full story. But um, we had been praying for her for 15 years. She was an addict. And she got radically saved by Jesus, her and her husband. And now next week, my mom's flying down to California so she can watch them get baptized together. <laughs> Man, they're driving an hour and 15 minutes every Wednesday night to go to a Bible study that they've gotten plugged into. And this is the gospel. This is the gospel. It's for all people. And nobody is too far gone. Nobody is excluded. Nobody has done too much that is outside the reach of Jesus. The gospel is for you. So here's how we're going to close today. Just like with all the other healings we read about that resulted in worship and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this did too. We're told the Gentiles began to speak and to praise God. And I think it's appropriate for us to finish today the same way. So I'm going to ask our worship team, if you're part of the worship team, I'm going to ask you to come up to the front and be ready. Um, we have our worship team up here, and we're going to spend these last few moments just creating an opportunity to respond to the message, to respond to the goodness, to respond and know that the gospel is for us. So again, if you're in the prayer team, you can get up right now. Come on up. It's okay. It's fine. You can come up right now. Um, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump into another time of worship this evening. So would you stand with me as we pray this morning? Lord Jesus, we believe in your goodness, and we're here today because of your faithfulness. For your faithfulness, you fulfilled the promise of the covenant that you gave to Abraham, that all nations of the world would be blessed through him. And here we are living out the promise. We are here today because of you and your goodness and your faithfulness towards us. God, thank you for being faithful to us when we're not even faithful to you. Jesus, we praise you today pray this in your name. Amen. Let's worship together. to
lean on your faithfulness today. The reason that we're here is because you're faithful. You carried out the promise. And now we can receive your love and your grace. Jesus, I'm so thankful for you today. And I'm thankful that you're the same God and you're still doing it today. You're still healing. You're still speaking. You're still sending love and grace to those who seem unlovable. Jesus, I'm thankful for your name being so powerful. With heads bowed and eyes closed, every week we always want to give opportunity. That if you're someone you feel like you don't know who Jesus is, you feel like you're too far from Jesus, you're too far broken, too, too messed up. Like I said earlier, the gospel is for you. And so we just want to ask right now, in a, in a moment of courage and boldness, if you're being moved to start following Jesus, I just want to ask that you would raise your hand. Not because raising your hand is any sort of sign or anything like that, but, but an outward expression of a decision that you're making in your heart. You want to say, I'm going to follow Jesus. If that's you, would you raise your hand right now? Yeah, I see those hands. Yep, I see that hand back there. Yeah. Yeah, over here I see that hand. Yeah. Let's pray this prayer together as a, as a church family. Say, Lord, today we admit that we've messed up, but we believe in your goodness. And now we confess that you are Lord of our lives. Jesus, today, I'm choosing to live for you. Thank you for your goodness and thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.